Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, A Brief History of Indigenous Chicago with Dr. John N. Lau. My name is Leah Gallant, and I'm the program curator at the Goethe Institute Chicago. And we're delighted to be hosting this talk in collaboration with the plant and the Chicago Architecture Biennial. This talk is the virtual keynote for our in-person event that happened this past Saturday entitled Land in Common, an interdisciplinary symposium about land justice that took place at the plant. And perhaps some of you joining us tonight were also in attendance. We're going to get started shortly. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Chantelle Anderson and Denise Elsman for their assistance uh, putting this event together. So we'll have 10 or 15 minutes at the end of Dr. Lau's talk for questions from the audience. Feel free to either post your questions in the chat during his talk or save them for the end. Um, and you should also be able to upvote questions in the chat if other people post things that you're particularly interested in seeing addressed. Before I introduce Dr. Lau, I'd just like to say a few words about the Goethe Institute. The Goethe Institute is the official cultural institution of the Federal Republic of Germany, with institutes located in nearly 160 cities around the world. We aim to foster the global exchange of art and ideas, to present German culture and history abroad, and to support the teaching and learning of the German language. We work with partners at institutions around the city and the Midwest on collaborative projects like this, presenting film screenings, music, panel discussions, art exhibitions, and et cetera, with different spaces in Chicago, at our space uh, here in Chicago's Loop, and virtually. So if you'd like to learn more about our upcoming Goethe Institute events, please sign up for our monthly mailing list. Um, I'll post a link in the chat or follow us on social media. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lau. Dr. Lau is a citizen of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians, an associate professor at the Ohio State University in Comparative Studies and director of the Newark Earthworks Center at the university. Lau received his PhD in American culture at the University of Michigan and also earned a graduate certificate in museum studies and a Juris Doctorate from that university. He received a BA from Michigan State University, a second BA in American Indian Studies from the University of Minnesota, and an MA in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago. His research interests and courses at The Ohio State University include American Indian histories, literatures and cultures, native identities, American Indian religions, indigenous canoe cultures around the world, urban American Indians, museums, material culture and representation, memory studies, indigenous futures, American Indian law and treaty rights, indigenous cross-cultural connections, and TIK environmental perspectives and practices. And he's also the author of the 2016 book, Imprints, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians and the City of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leah. Uh, much uh, thanks, much gratitude to the uh, Goethe Institute uh, for honoring me with this invitation and doing uh, all the things necessary to make this webinar possible. I'm greatly uh, uh, grateful for all that effort and also, uh, I say miigwech, thank you to uh, the audience here today. Uh, I know that it's a, a Tuesday early evening uh, and uh, maybe uh, uh, some of you had other things that you could have been doing, but you chose to come here and spend time with me and us instead, for which I am greatly appreciative. I'm going to, I should mention that, you know, I teach classes uh, every semester uh, at uh, the Ohio State University, and they're all 80-minute classes. So I have to watch myself because my body clock is essentially an 80-minute body clock. 
but I will try to be very careful uh, and uh, not uh, inflict that upon you. So um, I'm going to talk about, and some of these, I, I just, uh, these slides, I just want you to see the images. Um, you know, it's, uh, and I'm hoping that we can have a conversation afterwards. Uh, I do have a uh, few cats that are uh, wandering around here and uh, they all want to introduce themselves to you too, but uh, uh, they have to remember who who buys the food and who pops the cans open. And that's uh, me, so hopefully they'll uh, give us a little space. Anyway, so a brief history of Indigenous Chicago as a part of the Land in Common uh, programming by the Goethe Institute. Uh, so uh, I guess this slide, uh, why I included it is to show the uh, wide range of what Indians look like today. You now it's not a race, it's not really an ethnicity, it's uh, uh, 700 and what is it now, 54 federally recognized tribes in the United States. We all have distinct uh, uh, communities and histories and uh, some shared culture and languages and some not. Um, and uh, But we're really, it's our legal and political status, American Indian people. So, um, so who is here? Uh, let me see if I can do this. Thank you. Uh, the uh, indigenous peoples of Northern Illinois uh, with the continental divide being here, north-south uh, waters could run uh, rivers, which were the highways of the time, ran east and west and north and south here in Chicago. Uh, it was at the uh, southern end, of course, of uh, what we now call Lake Michigan. And so it was a place of uh, where we live. It's also a place of traverse. I liken it to um, O'Hare International Airport with the Chicago Portage. There are a lot of people that were traversing through here. We had different ideas about national identity. Uh, clan identities were important. And uh, the uh, we weren't obsessed with, uh, you know, our friends, relatives, and allies couldn't come on to our land without a visa or a passport. Uh, people came through, traded, traveled, talked, shared ideas, uh, shared uh, all sorts of things. So it was uh, lots of people were in Northern Illinois and came through the Chicago area. So um, this is uh, a map of the uh, Potawatomi villages along the west side of Lake Michigan and around uh, the bo bottom and to the east uh, shows that uh, Potawatomi, uh, before the diaspora of the uh, 1830s uh, by the federal government, Potawatomi were the largest uh, tribe in the Great Lakes region, uh, as is reflected by uh, the village sites. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, uh, the villages very close to uh, what we now call Chicago, what my ancestors called Jagoganak, Jagoganak. And uh, so uh, we've been here. Uh, our stories vary. We have numerous uh, uh, creation stories. Some stories tell us that we migrated from the uh, Atlantic uh, shores of the Atlantic Ocean at the St. Lawrence River, but other stories tell us that we were created either at the uh, at Grand Rapids, at Milwaukee, or indeed at Chicago, and that in those stories, we've been here since the beginning of time. In any event, we've been here for a long, long time. So this is uh, Indian Court of Claims, uh, took testimony of elders, uh, tribal authorities, uh, et cetera, beginning in the 1950s and onward until about the 1970s and drew up this map of essentially where are the ancestral lands of the people of the Great Lakes, which shows, of course, um, 
my point is that Chicago is squarely within Potawatomi lands. Not that there weren't other people living here, of course, and I'll get to that in a minute. And not that we didn't intermarry with lots of other people who then became Potawatomi, and not that we didn't share lots with other people, but Chicago is on Potawatomi land, of course, of which I'm very proud. So another map. After the Beaver Wars of the uh, 17th century, the Beaver Wars were in the 1600s and the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee essentially drove most Algonquin people out of the Great Lakes region as they uh, uh, sought uh, um, access to more beaver pelts for trade. Uh, and they we nearly were exterminated, driven to Door County. But fortunately, uh, we uh, grew back in size, uh, secured firearms. Uh, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee had firearms from the uh, Dutch. We finally got the French to give us firearms, and we drove the Iroquois back. And so in the 1600s, uh, as Europeans were coming here, Father Marquette, uh, Joliet, and others, they were seeing a repopulating of the entire area. And so some of their uh, writings about who was here, who they met, has to be taken into the context of we are all in the process of coming home. So and for the Potawatomi, coming home was a very large area that stretched from Green Bay down south of Chicago, uh, up to Grand Rapids, Michigan, over to Detroit, and then down uh, to the Maumee River near what is now called Ohio. So, large area. So, uh, perhaps some of you have uh, been to the Chicago Portage National Historic Site, um, celebrating Marquette and Joliet. Um, I like kind of the uh, modernism uh, style of it. I have to be honest, but that's about all I like about it, uh, because of course there's the the usual trope, right, of the uh, Europeans discovering something, and uh, the Indians, the hapless Indians, dragging the canoes um, under the direction of the smarter, more sophisticated Europeans. That's not how it happened. Marquette and Joliet didn't discover anything. They were uh, brought to uh, the Chicago Portage. They were shown the Chicago Portage. And lastly, anyone that loves birch bark canoes as much as me knows that you don't drag birch bark canoes. Uh, you have to carry them over your head. They're wonderful uh, means of transportation, but they're very fragile being dragged. Uh, you carry them over your head. So uh, perhaps someday we'll get a counter-narrative statue that celebrates the indigenous peoples, uh, uh, likely Potawatomi, that we're showing uh, Marquette and Joliet how to get uh, from Chicago uh, down the Des Plaines River <clears throat> to the Illinois River uh, to uh, and on and on to the Mississippi, which allowed them access to um, the Ohio River, uh, the Missouri River, uh, Mississippi up north to uh, Minnesota, Atasca, south to the Gulf of Mexico, or uh, east uh, to the Atlantic Ocean on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River up to Hudson Bay, or um, anywhere else you wanted to go, basically. So, um, uh, Jean Baptiste de Sable. Uh, we have now uh, a, a very exciting, you know, we've changed Lakeshore Drive, which, you know, I grew up uh, within the Pokagon Potawatomi community and uh, uh, love Chicago. Chicago is the big city where I come from. Uh, and, uh, you know, I grew up uh, with TV coming across the lake, you know, a big uh, Bulls hockey team. Uh, and, uh, a Bears uh, fan, Bulls, uh, every, uh, Cubs, everybody. And uh, used to watch Channel 9. Uh, and uh, so uh, I grew up with Lakeshore Drive. Probably most of you did too. Now it's DuSable Lake, Lakeshore Drive, which is good. But, um, you know, DuSable, who's 
considered by some the founder of contemporary Chicago. The only way he was able to operate was by marrying uh, Kitty Hawa, Potawatomi Indian woman from a prominent family. That allowed him to establish a trading business. So uh, I think it, uh, we need to, in our historical memory, our community member, our co- memory, our collective memory, remember uh, the power and influence and contribution of Kitty Hawa uh, as, as much as uh, Jean Baptiste de Sable. But both can be honored in a good way. So, What's been the nature of uh, history uh, since uh, colonists uh, got to Chicago was attempts at annihilation, removal, et cetera, versus Indians trying to survive. Uh, And uh, so it's been uh, a roller coaster ride for uh, Native people. Uh, Divide this up into six parts. I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. Uh, Part one was... uh, Battle of Fort Dearborn. It's uh, one of the stars on the Chicago uh, village or city flag. Uh, is uh, Fort Dearborn was established by the Treaty of Greenville, 1895. Uh, the signatory to that treaty that allowed that to happen was Chief Topmaby, who was Pokagon of Potawatomi Indian. Uh, he was, pro, you know, proto uh, Pokagon band. He was uh, Pokagon's father, but. Uh, uh, so uh, they established a fort at the mouth of the Chicago River, but they didn't treat Indians fairly. They didn't treat Indians very well. And so many of the warriors were um, connected with uh, Tecumseh's uh, resistance movement. And uh, so, uh, and then there was, of course, the resulting Second Revolutionary War, if you will, of 1812 between British uh, the UK and the United States and the Potawatomi uh, who were in control of the area as it was their lands uh, burned Fort Dearborn down. So uh, it's been depicted as a massacre. If you look here closely, uh, you know, the title of this is the Fort Dearborn Massacre uh, shows uh, a black partridge saving a Mrs. Helm uh, reflects sort of that uh, binary that Indians are generally placed in, either as the noble savage or the uh, noble noble savage or savage red man, right? Uh, so there's the good Indian and the bad Indian. Uh, and, uh, you know, people aren't that s- simple, right? And so, and it's just not historically accurate. Uh, it's in uh, storage now. When um, uh, Simon Bokagan, a prolific writer, um, was interviewed about the uh, Fort Dearborn uh, resistance. Uh, He pointed out that, you know, although the meta-narrative of the settler colonists uh, at the time in Chicago, even by the, uh, was that this was a uh, horrible massacre. Uh, Simon Pokagan pointed out, when whites are killed, it's a massacre, but when Indians are killed, it's a fight. Well, uh, there is... uh, uh, since 2013, there was this area uh, on the south side where the uh, that Fort Dearborn massacre statue stood for several decades uh, that was uh, made in the green space. And I read about uh, the developer uh, proposing that uh, they reinstall that statue and call it Fort Dearborn uh, Massacre Park. Well, so I wrote, not expecting to get much of an answer, but I did. And he said, I'm really glad that you reached out. I didn't know who to inquire about this. And I explained to him my issues, most Native American Indians' issues with that statue, being racist, as being historically inaccurate, the, the contextualization of the battle, which was a battle uh, as a massacre, uh, really was... Uh, you know, incendiary. Uh, so uh, together with they we formed the uh, ad hoc committee and it became Battle of Fort Dearborn Park. And so in 2009, uh, veterans from the Pokagon Potawatomi came to celebrate the opening of that park. And uh, so it was a good thing and it's still there to this day. 
And I think generally in the school curriculums and city uh, uh, hall things, whatever, is, that uh, is generally referred to as the Battle of Fort Dearborn, not uh, the Fort Dearborn Massacre. So the um, uh, second part was the 1833 Treaty of Chicago. That is a picture of Leopold Pokagan, uh, the patriarch of our tribe. Uh, we generally did not name ourselves after people. We never named ourselves after people. Uh, usually sites, you know, the St. Joseph River Valley or Natawasipi Valley, uh, or Potawatomi. But the government started calling this uh, Pokagan's Band. And so we, um, you, know, you know, finally endured to take that name. So we understand that we're Poc the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi. That's where that name comes from. <laughs> so, um, and uh, in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, Leopold Pokagan negotiated an, ex an exemption for our nation, the Pokagan Potawatomi, since the entire villages, the villages along the St. Joseph River had primarily converted to Catholicism, Christianity. We were exempted from removal uh, that was being uh, uh, planned with the 1830 Indian Removal Act. And that's what this treaty was a part of, was taking our land away uh, in preparation for moving us out. Um, and uh, I oftentimes hear, well, that was a treaty between the Council of the Three Fires. If you look at the treaty title, it calls us a united nation of, it never uses the phrase Council of the Three Fires. We were a Council of the Three Fires, but we have distinct languages. We have distinct uh, cultural practices, distinct spiritual practices, and we never shared territory. To my knowledge, we never shared territory until Europeans got here. And so this was Potawatomi land. All the signers of the 1833 treaty uh, were Potawatomi, and most of the signers before that were treaty. If you look at the people involved in Chicago history, Antoine Wilmette, Wilmette's named after him. How did he stay here? He's a trader who married a Potawatomi woman. Billy Caldwell, Saganash, uh, married a Potawatomi woman. Uh, Dusabo married a Potawatomi woman. To be able to stay here, to be a part of Chicago, you had to uh, become Potawatomi. So those that weren't uh, uh, converted to Christianity got moved out on a uh, trail of death in 1838. Uh, and that included uh, uh, Indians from Northern Illinois, from Indiana, walked all the way out. And these were the Indians, the Potawatomi, that were refusing to convert to Christianity. And uh, so there are no uh, uh, Potawatomi Nation's Prairie Band out in Kansas and Citizen Band uh, down in Oklahoma, uh, the Forest County, uh, the, some Potawatomi fled to Forest County up in Northern Wisconsin, uh, uh, Potawatomi fled to Canada and Mexico, but there's no trail of death for anybody else being walked out of Chicago um, because why is there no Ojibwe or Odawa or Menominee or Ho-Chunk trail of death? Because they weren't around. Uh, it was Potawatomi people that were around and then the ones that suffered the consequences of being in the way. And so at the very least, we should honor them as the, uh, uh, the uh, first inhabitants before removal of uh, Chicago land, in my opinion. Part three is Simon Pokagan, uh, that is uh, Leopold Pokagan's son. Uh, he became a uh, uh, pretty big celebrity at the end of the 1890s. Uh, in the 1890s, he uh, didn't dress as an Indian, wanted, wrote extensively about wanting to be a part of the uh, American experience, the American opportunities, the American dream, that Indians should be afforded the opportunity to do those things, that he wasn't going to play Indian. Uh, he wasn't going to be the white man's Indian. He was going to be an Indian Indian. And so he spoke. That's him over here to the right, my right anyway, spoke before an audience of 7,000 people uh, at Chicago Day at the World's Columbian Exposition. 
which was very exciting. Uh, he wrote uh, at, for the Columbian Exposition, the Red Man's Grading on Birch Bark, a Birch Bark Leaf. Birch Bark is considered sacred uh, material, sacred medicine uh, by the Potawatomi people. And so his putting this message that essentially complained about how do you expect us to celebrate uh, the last 500 years of you building a great nation when you don't include us? And so uh, pretty persuasive, pretty profound. He also wrote a book that was published after his death, Ogamakwe Medikwaki, which roughly translates to Queen of the Woods. Um, and uh, you can find sometimes uh, it's in libraries. Um, you can find it on eBay occasionally. There's several reprints. Uh, there's a reprint that I contributed to uh, with essays by uh, colleagues. So uh, pretty good book. Um, and so um, part four, claims to the Chicago lakefront. So um, laying back, um, you know, this has become a uh, common uh, phrase in the last few years. Again, hearing that phrase of laying back, but I knew already from the stories that my elders told me that we had fought for the Chicago lakefront back beginning in the early 1900s. And that lawsuit was led by Michael Williams uh, and his brother, John Williams, um, who were uh, on our uh, government's committee for the Pokagon Potawatomi. So we sued for the Chicago lakefront. And what were we suing for? Well, uh, Michigan Avenue used to run along the lakefront. And I'm using my cursor here. Um, water tower place. The reason it's there is it was on the shoreline. Uh, after the Chicago fire, there was a lot of stuff that needed to get uh, dumped, deposited somewhere. And so they filled in the lake. All of this area is uh, filled in lake bed. This too, you look over here. This is all filled in. Up here's Field Museum. Other than that, it's just uh, um, landfill. Well, the thing is, um, in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, uh, the boundary for that uh, northeast corner of Illinois that we ceded, we used, uh, the treaty used, the lake shore in 1833. Well, afterwards, uh, after 1871, they extended it more than a mile into the lake. Well, we never gave up that lake. Uh, and uh, so uh, that lake bed was unseated territory. That lake is unseated. Uh, and so we were never compensated for it and we never uh, ceded it to the United States government. So it was just um, uh, a bamboozle, uh, hinky dink. Uh, and so we sued. And we finally took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And judging from these people, who do you think that they would side with? Um, a bunch of uh, relatively poor Indians uh, from somewhere in the Midwest or um, the powers like the city of Chicago, Chicago Park District, uh, the Gary Steelworks, uh, the, uh, and all the other businesses, uh, the Potter Palmers and the Gold Coast set, the Streeterville set, the Lakeshore Drive set, the Silk Stockings set. Well, we didn't fare too good. We lost. In a two-paragraph opinion, the Supreme Court said, um, oh, well, the Indians might have had a claim to it, but they abandoned it. How were we to abandon it? Were we supposed to keep canoes out there uh, 24 hours a day for 100 years? Uh, I'm not sure what they meant, but they were in no mood to, but we know, you know, Supreme Courts in the past, without even getting into contemporary issues, the Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, that uh, slavery was constitutional. Uh, they ruled that uh, segregation was constitutional. Uh, they've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, they're not infallible. Hopefully someday, um, uh, the, the wrong can be righted. And judging from the, uh, I, I don't see the current Supreme Court as being particularly um, 
sensitive to Indian related issues, but they certainly are uh, willing to overrule precedents, um, Roe v. Wade. Uh, so perhaps they'll uh, uh, overrule this precedent uh, someday and we'll get our land back. Uh, part five is I want to talk about the American Indian Center. Chicago has the uh, Urban Indian Center uh, in the nation. Uh, the uh, Indian Center began after World War II with uh, uh, the movement of uh, the Potawatomi had been removed for some uh, more than 100 years. But, uh, and so there were only a small scattering of uh, Potawatomi people still left in Chicago. Uh, and they kept their heads down pretty good. But uh, the uh, Leroy we saw to the left of that photograph was a member, a co-founder of the American Indian Center, and he founded in the 1970s the Chicago Canoe Club, which was a wonderful uh, social thing, also sport. They did competitive uh, canoe racing, and uh, they also created a public space. People had forgotten about Indians other than these friezes and plaques and monuments of bowman and spearman, et cetera, on, uh, sitting in bronze and granite. Uh, they'd forgotten that there are still real live Indians uh, around. And so uh, the Indians became the, uh, uh, the public face uh, for Chicago. And people started to realize, hey, we're still here. Uh, and Leroy we saw was Pokegan Potawatomi, which I'm quite proud of. Um, and uh, it was also a uh, social uh, thing that was really cool. It brought a lot of people. Uh, this inner, this uh, Indian center was very intertribal during the removal and uh, relocation uh, of the 1950s. Indians were encouraged to go to uh, major cities like Chicago. Oakland, Seattle, uh, Phoenix, uh, Cleveland, and elsewhere, Denver. Uh, and the idea was that uh, we'd get lost in the melting pot, we'd get cut off from our culture and our identity, and we would just evaporate, right? Well, it didn't work like that. Indians, once again, showed uh, with our strength and resilience that um, we adapt. And so this Chicago Indian Center became a great intertribal, uh, 120 or more tribes are represented by membership there. But there were things that they could embrace together, like powwows, like round dances, like feasts, and canoeing. And so the Chicago Canoe Club became really popular. Uh, here's uh, the uh, Canoe Club uh, going down the Chicago River. Imagine in uh, uh, what year was this, uh, 1968, uh, uh, people uh, in downtown Chicago seeing all these uh, Indians uh, canoeing their, uh, uh, their birch bark canoes down the Chicago River. Uh, I would have loved to have been there. Uh, I would have loved to have seen uh, the looks on their faces. We're still here. And we followed uh, the route of Marquette and claimed it as our own. Right. And we uh, went on uh, events uh, all around the country, and we circled the Manhattan Canoe. You know, the newspaper, of course, has got to make it uh, sensational uh, by calling them war canoes. They're just really great canoes. They should have used the title, really great canoes, circle Manhattan Island. But, you know, that's once again. But it shows that uh, this became a really important thing for Indians in Chicago and uh, the representation and the resilience and presentation of Chicago Indian peoples. So, and in the brick lodge that was installed in 2009 at the Foster Avenue and Lakeshore Drive underpass, there is a image of uh, the canoe that honors the Chicago, Chicago American Indian community past and present. So part six is uh, urban Indians today. Uh, there's probably, oh, I don't know the recent, most recent census figures, but there's probably at least 40,000 uh, Native American Indian peoples in Chicago today. Um, 
the uh, uh, and we do all sorts of things. Uh, we uh, have a vibrant Chicago uh, uh, American Indian Center. Uh, it's moved uh, to, I think, Albany Park from the uptown neighborhood to Albany Park. Um, and uh, so it's uh, a place now that, uh, you know, we're three, four generations into it. And I'm certainly not one to say that, well, you know, this isn't your land or your homeland or your birthplace, you know. If if your grandparents were here and your parents were here and you were born here, you're Chicago Indian too, in my opinion. And so this is an image of a totem pole that was erected in Lincoln Park. Uh, and of course, totem poles don't have any business. Being in the Great Lakes area, they are uh, an icon and a material culture of the United States Northwest in Canada Northwest. Uh, but you know, they became uh, a uh, stand-in for a non-native people for Indian. But the interesting thing I found when I lived in Chicago for more than 10 years is that many times people would, Indian people would say, I'll meet you at the totem pole. And everybody knew right where that was. And so it was kind of cool. It became a place of, uh, uh, we uh, took it as our own, <laughs> we made it our own. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, proposed land uh, and I'm going to stop right there and leave that screen up if that's okay and uh, again thank you for listening to my presentation and I'm wondering uh, Leah if uh, there's any uh, questions that, that anybody has yes thank you so much Dr. Lau that was incredible um, we have one question currently, which I will read. Um, for everyone else, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, so this is from Blake Lenoir, uh, who says, Buju John, I'm Blake, and I'd like to ask you about Billy Caldwell and Alexander Robinson. What legacy have they left behind for Native Americans in our area? Sure. Uh, Buju Blake. I know Blake. Uh, I know uh, know him mostly through emails and stuff, and seeing what he's doing. But uh, cool. Uh, thank you for attending, Blake. So uh, Alexander Robinson um, uh, was uh, was became a leader as we married uh, into the uh, Potawatomi uh, people living here. Also became a leader of his group of Potawatomi. And, uh, you know, Chicago was big enough. There were numerous villages uh, at that time. He became a leader, became somewhat of a cultural bridge, a negotiator uh, for Potawatomi people. And uh, from what I can see, uh, tried to do his best to represent Potawatomi peoples uh, in very difficult circumstances. Usually the choices were bad or worse for Indian people. The treaty making, the land sessions, which were, you know, just basically, basically, uh, you know, when the uh, federal government and their treaty uh, commissioners came to make a treaty, uh, we, we didn't have a choice. There, this was not voluntary. This was not optional. Uh, it was essentially, you're going to be removed. We have this law that says you're going to be removed. We have this military force that says you're going to be removed. Now is your chance to make your best deal, or we'll just the land, or we'll find somebody else to sign the treaty. And so uh, I think Alexander Robinson uh, did the best he could in difficult circumstances. Interestingly enough, Blake, uh, there is um, uh, Robinson Woods was uh, a small tract of land that was set aside uh, for the Robinson family, and uh, that land was never uh, legally taken uh, by um, only the federal government can take uh, Indian land, not cities, not states. Uh, that's according to a U.S. Supreme Court from uh, uh, 1820. Uh, only the federal government can, and they didn't do anything appropriate or proper. So that land, Robinson Woods, the descendants would still like to recover that land. Uh, they are primarily um, 
the Robinson family went out to Kansas and are now, as I understand it, a part of the Prairie Potawatomi Nation. And uh, so it might be an opportunity for the Prairie Potawatomi to return also. So we'll have to see how that shakes out. Lots of opportunity there. Billy Caldwell, Sauganash, there's a neighborhood many of you know of, named after him, uh, Sauganash. Um, and basically, uh, British is what it means in Potawatomi, is that he was a mixed blood. He was Mohawk and British, and he came down to Chicago and married a Potawatomi woman. I bet you knew that was going to happen, right? And so, and he also became a leader of the community because he was multilingual, smart guy, a leader of his village in the Chicago area. Also, um, uh, you know, tried to, I believe, negotiate the best uh, possibilities in a bad situation. And so uh, the Caldwells, as I understand it, that family went with their communities also on that trail of death out to uh, what's now Curry Band, Potawatomi in Mayetta, Kansas. Thanks, Blake. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, one of our guests, Veronica Passfield. Um, I'll unmute you, and if you want to say your question, um, feel free to. Ani, John, I put my question in the in the Q and A too. Uh, Ani, you on me? Ani, yes. Sorry, I'll say. Okay, so I'll say my question because I wrote it out. I love I love that you're giving this talk, Miigwech. And I just had was thinking about um, when I was driving around as a new arrival to Chicago, because I'm Ojibwe and, you know, I'm from the north, northern part of our territory. And I was thinking about um, when I was driving through, I think it was Winnetka or Wilmette, and there was an old sign on Green Bay Road that talked about how this road was historically sort of a safe passageway between forts um, when you in case you know violent Indians um, were going to come upon you as a pioneer and and harm you, and I was kind of startled at how regressive that was, and that in a really kind of upscale, educated place that this would still be tolerated. So I just wondered what your perspective was on you know among all the things that we have to do in life, why it's important to take time to advocate for better. Miigwech. Uh, Miigwech, Veronica, and thank you for attending, and thank you for the very good question, Miigwech. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, you know, uh, there was in Chicago with the previous mayor, uh, the Monuments and Memorials Project uh, that uh, studied at length. I had lots of uh, uh, community uh, uh, input, a lot of transparency. Uh, a lot of uh, Native and non-Native scholars, a lot of stakeholders, uh, everybody participated in that more than year-long project to complete a white paper uh, that uh, talked about the Columbus statue, talked about the Fort Dearborn Massacre statue. Um, I don't know that we got to this time on Green Bay Road, uh, but uh, it was in that same kind of tenor, right? Um, who and what are we celebrating? Uh, and why. And uh, so uh, that project um, uh, kind of got uh, lost in the shuffle with the last election, I think. And I don't know what the status is now. We made numerous recommendations. I don't know how much this is on the radar of the current mayor. Hopefully uh, it will get uh, reinvigorated uh, because we had very good ideas about what and what not to do about monuments and memorials. But you're absolutely right uh, that uh, these things can be very, you know, they are both propaganda for the settler colonists to, yeah, see, you know, they were savage back in the day, uh, but also very depressing for us as Native people, right? I'm sure for you and for me is that, you know, they were meaner to us than we were to them. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, but you know my my good friend Andrea Carlson 
Veronica, you may know, she's also a Anishinaabe Kway, uh, Jibwe uh, woman, person, artist, uh, put up that banner on Wacker Drive uh, that uh, uh, shouts to the world, uh, you are on Potawatomi lands. And I believe it's still up there. And uh, so, and I was able to um, uh, co-curate an exhibit that'll be opening next spring at the Marquette building uh, where the MacArthur Foundation is located on the first floor that will essentially also be an intervention for you know, a counter history of indigenous Chicago. So uh, I would encourage people to uh, come to that opening. I would also encourage people to go to the Field Museum's uh, new Native American exhibits uh, I was uh, not expecting much um, from the Field Museum, and I was amazingly surprised at how well done it was and really exciting stuff. So, um, um, but you're right, uh, Veronica, the work continues. And so we just keep, uh, keep plugging along, and, and, you know, that's why we look uh, seven generations. It's not just for what we can do for them but what they may need to do for themselves too. And for the next seven generations past that. So this is an educational process. This is a learning process. And so for all of you that are here today, I uh, say again, miigwech, thank you that uh, you're willing to listen to me um, as just one native person's perspective on all of this. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question, I'm actually going to combine two questions about land acknowledgements, uh, one from Dora Gonzalez and one from Judy Pollack. Um, so the first part of that is why there is a blank space at the end of your proposed land acknowledgement that we see up here, sort of what would go in that. And then the second point is um, why is it that so many organizations have land acknowledgements that feature the Council of the Three Fires? Um, great question. Uh, I'll take the easy one first, is that line at the bottom is um, basically a kind of a fill in, fill in the blank moment and uh, what you may be able to do. Uh, when I've been working with the MacArthur Foundation, they are an extremely well endowed philanthropic organization. So the level of commitments that they can make are huge and should be huge and need to be huge. And they are huge uh, around the world. And, uh, and they've created new ones for indigenous peoples. Um, on the other hand, I've also done the land acknowledgement. I worked with the Naperville Public Library. Uh, you know, they have a bare bones budget. Uh, they can't uh, do much, you know, but they made a commitment to increase their holdings of uh, Native authors, uh, to increase their programming, to have Native speakers, uh, to celebrate Native American Heritage Month, which we're doing today, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, so they, you know, so that blank is to reflect the fact that not everybody will be able to do the same, that, but everybody can do something. So uh, the, uh, why don't the, uh, why do so many organizations talk about the Council of the Three Fires? Well, I've talked with the folks at the Field Museum. I've talked with the folks at uh, the American Indian Center. I've talked with the folks at the Mitchell Museum. I've talked with the folks at the Northwestern. Uh, I've talked with the folks at uh, UIC. The general impression I get from talking with all those folks, um, who generally the consensus is, you know, and I provide them with a paper about this. I had an article uh, this year, earlier this year, in Chicago History Magazine about this. Uh, uh, and uh, their response is, that's all very well and good. We respect your scholarship. We uh, get your point. But, and then they kind of trail off. It's a political issue. Is there are people now that... Uh, Nobody's going to fight over um, whose land does Beloit, Wisconsin sit on. You know, it's just, there's no juice there. There's nothing that, you know, it's like, nobody cares, really. Um, I'm sure Beloit's a very nice town, but, uh, you know, uh, 
but uh, Chicago, there's a lot of juice to being connected to Chicago. And so, you know, uh, it's a political issue, a political decision. decision. Uh, it's not factual. It's not based in uh, history. But it's, uh, people don't want to give up the idea that, uh, and why should, you know, Indians aren't any different than a lot of other people. They don't like change. They grew up with this idea that Chicago is the council of three fires. And they just really, you know, nobody likes change except babies, right? And uh, so, but it's a process that I'm, uh, I'm hoping to live to be 100. So I'll have uh, a lot more years to continue uh, just trying to educate people. And it's not that uh, I think that, Lots of people should be honored. Everybody should be honored. Everybody should, uh, you know, have opportunities for uh, collaboration, support, promotion, celebration. It's just that I grew up knowing the elders told me that Chicago was the ancestral Potawatomi land. And then, you know, when I came here and I saw this council of the three fires, it was like, and then I did research and it's, it's not right. Well, what do, you know, I'm a professor. I teach history classes. What do we do when something's not right? We we try to give a new perspective to it. But thank you for asking. Great, thank you. Um, So next we have a question from Alta Price about current linguistic heritage uh, in Chicago and the surroundings um, in terms of speakers of Potawatomi languages. Okay, sure. Um, well, we've been uh, blessed that um, Forest County up in Wisconsin uh, uh, have very fluent speakers. Uh, Prairie Band in Kansas also have fluent speakers. We were close to Pokagon Potawatomi and the other two, uh, the Gun Lake Band and the Nottawasippi Band of Potawatomi, two other tribal Potawatomi tribal nations in southwest Michigan. We had come very close to losing our language uh, because of uh, uh, education policies against uh, indigenous uh, languages, languages just not being taught, you know, the boarding schools that impressed upon us to be ashamed of being Indian or talking Indian, uh, you know, the language being beaten out of us. So, uh, but we've had a program, Pokagon Potawatomi, where we have master apprentices go up and live with uh, Potawatomi first language speakers up in Forest County, Wisconsin. Uh, and, uh, and then after two years, they come back and then we send more and they start. Our, so we've got a very vibrant uh, language program. We also partnered with Mango so that uh, there's an app uh, on, that you can put on your phone where you can practice your Potawatomi and uh, so it's, uh, I don't think you need to speak the language. You don't need to be fluent in the language to be part of me. I reject that argument, but I do think it helps to understand how to me thought, worldview, values, et cetera, if you have a sense of what the language was about, absolutely. Thank you. So next we have a question from Abby Hambright, um, who says, I'd love to hear more about this idea of settler or non-Indigenous men marrying Potawatomi women and reframing how it's usually talked about as if the men took women away from their culture, um, whereas instead it's reframed as marrying into Potawatomi society. Um, Abby says, I haven't heard that framing, but it makes so much sense. Uh, that would be a narrative that was suppressed. If you could respond to that. Sure. Um, uh, another great question. Yeah, I suspect that uh, uh, that uh, the old school framing of the uh, of the marriages. Um, I'm not surprised that they would have been that uh, you know these uh, white men blessed us with their presence. And with their willingness to marry one of our um, one of our women from our our tribe, you know that's uh, 
but as as the uh, the questioner uh, points out, that's that's not what was happening, right? It was the Paduanme. First, the families had to decide that the uh, white person was a uh, uh, an appropriate match. Uh, the person, the woman themselves, had to decide whether it was a match. Uh, we didn't have arranged marriages um, uh, in our tradition. And so there had to be a basis for that marriage to succeed. But it also, everybody understood that it brought uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, again, people were trying to figure out how are we going to be able to stay in the area and remain indigenous, remain Paduanme. And so uh, they were, you know, mar- this was an attempt. You know, let's uh, let's build relationships, literal relationships, right, with these people. These people may understand, uh, these men may understand the white world where they come from better than we can or we do, but they don't understand us as well as we do, of course. So if we make that connection and, you know, for the Cherokee, for instance, you know, they, their leaders, um, I think one of their uh, greatest uh, leader in the 1830s against the Cherokee uh, Trail of Tears and the removal um, was um, only uh, a quarter Cherokee. Uh, and, you know, they had intermarried so many generations, but that he was no less Cherokee. Uh, and he was no less committed to his tribe. And uh, so so people were trying to figure out what can we do um, to be able to stay on the land if possible, on the ancestral lands. The lands have the bones. We walk on the bones of our ancestors with pride because we've been here for so long. How do we get to stay here? And how, if we're going to stay here, how can we remain, to our minds, identified, identify ourselves, know ourselves, understand ourselves as Potawatomi, okay, and Potawatomi, whatever, indigenous, native, whatever, right? So. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so then we have two possibly related questions. Um, Another one from Blake uh, about why Chicago is named after the wild onion and asking if that's a Miamia or Potawatomi word in origin. Um, And then also a question from Samantha Rosa asking about the indigenous relationship to native Chicago ecosystems. Um, So for example, the indigenous stewardship of the native prairie and oak woodlands. Um, Sure. Okay. Um, Well, the, uh, you know, the Miami, the Miami are are, our younger uh, brothers, as we call them, to the Potawatomi. Now, we spoke similar languages, uh, Algonquian root family, uh, they're not mutually intelligible, but they're very similar. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, there may be Miami people that have stories that tell them that uh, Chicago is a Miami word. Uh, but um, I've spoken with our uh, language uh, master uh, uh, people, and uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a Potawatomi word. When I first came to Chicago, I would see it oftentimes spelled out as Chicago, uh, which I knew that wasn't right because just like Iroquois, you know, that's not an Indian word. That's a French word. Chicago with an O-U on the end. That's a French word. And so I knew that wasn't the word. And so I talked with our language and they asked elders, you know, um, <laughs> What what was called, Chicago called, and uh, you know, and and it uh, you know, as they uh, look back up here. Jogaganuk, uh, Jogaganuk. Um, I don't know what the Miami uh, word. I suspect it's somewhat close to that. 
Um, but uh, that's the word that uh, we understand to be uh, what this place is called. And you can see where Chicago would come out of that. Um, you know, not too difficult. As far as uh, management uh, of the environment, um, we lived for uh, uh, thousands of years. You know, the uh, archaeologists say for um, what, somewhere between 10 to 40,000 years in this area, our stories tell us our elders tell us uh, that some of the stories say we've lived here since the beginning of time. Uh, and uh, But we lived sustainable lives. Uh, we lived, uh, we didn't, uh, we had a connection with our environment around us where, um, you know, we did not have this Judeo-Christian thing as we dominate the environment and we exploit it and use it for our own benefit. We were connected to the environment. Um, we had to take care of these things. Uh, and just like other things, had to take care of us. And it was a mutually reciprocal relationship. Uh, most things, certainly everything living, had a spirit. Um, uh, lots of things had spirit. You know, the rivers had spirit. The rocks had spirit. Uh, and uh, you need to honor that. And so we didn't live in a way... We managed environments sometimes, certainly down here at Newark, where I'm at, the Newark Earthworks, it appears that those areas for the Earthworks, the Great Circle and the Octagon, two places that you're probably not familiar with, but please feel free to check out the Newark Earthworks Center website. Uh, those were probably uh, fired, cleared by Native people. There may have been, plain, and that creates a different, uh, uh, diverse uh, ecosystem. Deer like it, other animals like it, some plants like it, the medicines like it. Uh, so there may have been uh, fire and other ways of clearing land in the Chicago area. But the most important thing, I think, is that um, you know, we lived sustainable lives, which we've lost and we need to get reconnected to. Uh, uh, is uh, because... Otherwise, you know, what kind of uh, world are we going to have to pass on to our grandchildren? Not much. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and first, I just want to note that there's a, a recommendation from, let's see, now I've lost this in the scroll. Uh, there's a recommendation for the Center for Native Futures in the Marquette Building in the Loop, um, yeah. as well as Andrea Carlson, who is a fantastic piece on exhibit at the DePaul Art Museum. So thank you for that recommendation, um, Hinda Seif. And we've, Chantel has also just posted the links to both of those if anyone wants to check them out. Um, so there are two questions uh, sort of about takeaways and continuing to learn and think about what you've shared. Um, one is any book recommendations that you have uh, for books that depict an accurate history of Chicago um, and its indigenous histories. And then the sort of related question is, um, what do you see as the current role of settler uh, or colonists living in the Chicago area um, in both acknowledging and naming our actions of the past and present, as well as working to dismantle them. Sure. Okay. So the first is uh, one book I would recommend besides my own, which you're very kind to uh, start off the conversation with that uh, imprints the Polkagan Band Potawatomi in the city of Chicago, 2016 Michigan State University Press. It's also uh, David Beck, B-E-C-K, who is now a professor down at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and his partner, Rosalind Lapeer, have authored a book uh, more recent, I think a couple of years later, about, uh, I would think its focus is primarily uh, activism, Indian activism in Chicago. And uh, so uh, anything that David Beck and Rosalind Lapeer have written about uh, uh, Chicago, which has been, um, um, you know, they're both, well, David Beck's from Chicago, and 
Governor Osmond appears from Wisconsin, I believe. But um, anyway, maybe Montana. Anyway, I digress. Uh, but anything that they wrote would be really good. Um, and uh, so um, that that would be, you know, there's what I have found too. And also this uh, magazine article that I had, Chicago History Magazine from this summer, uh, if you can get a, or if you want to email me, I'll send you a copy of the uh, article. I do have a digital copy. So that would be lau, L-O-W dot 89 at OSU dot E-D-U. Lau dot 89 at OSU dot E-D-U. Just tell me that you want a copy of the Chicago History Magazine article, and I'm more than happy to send it to you. Um, and so I think this is a good start. Uh, a lot of the other books written um, are written by um, the dead white guys, essentially, from, you know, 80 years ago. So they're not so good, or 100 years ago. So they're not so good. Uh, the second question about uh, what should uh, the descendants of settler colonists do now? Is that sort of what uh, about the... Did I get that correct, Leah? Um, so what do you see as the current role of... Um settlers living in the Chicago area, both in acknowledging the past and the present, um, and also sort of concrete actions that we can participate in to dismantle those. Yeah, well, that brings up a great uh, uh, point. Uh, thank you for asking that question, whomever, uh, because I want to say there is some controversy in Indian country among Indian people when acknowledgments are done. Uh, and they are, if they only have, I'm on the land of the whatever Indian people, thank you, uh, or I acknowledge that, or I honor that. Well, um, that's pretty hollow. Uh, it's like saying, thank you for stealing my land. Uh, you know, uh, thank you for stealing my bike. Uh, you know, it's like, but I don't agree with the idea that we should just scrap land acknowledgments entirely because even those lame land acknowledgments land acknowledgments if we just get people educated about who used to live here that's that's good that's not a bad thing that they're used to you know this was not a wild wilderness this was not empty lands waiting to be settled uh this was land that was occupied by people living sophisticated, happy lives before settler colonists moved in and destroyed their lives. So the first half is a sort of an equation. The first half uh, with the land acknowledgement is honor the land you're on, uh, but then drop the other shoe of the therefore what? What am I as an individual or my employer or my organization willing to do to commit to, uh, um, you know, recon you know some reconciliation, right? That's, uh, you know, I'm not, you can't undo history. Not, not going to be able to move everybody back off the continent. Uh, so um, now I'm not asking people to give me their house or their home or their farm or whatever. You know, but what are the concrete steps what are you, and this should be a living document that changes all the time, particularly the commitment aspect, the reconciliation aspect, is that therefore, because I'm on the land of somebody else and reaping the benefits of having grown up on that land and my ancestors and my descendants are getting to live on this wonderful land now, how am I going to uh, make amends? Uh, to the people that were displaced. Find out who they were. Find out what, and, and don't just tell them what you're going to do. Don't just throw money at a problem. Don't just uh, uh, tell them, oh, well, I'm going to do this A, B, and C for you. Find out who they are. Find out who their decision makers are. Find out what they would like to see have happen. Right? Maybe they'd uh, like to see a, uh, you know, Miami University that is home for the Miami Center now, right? Indiana University Bloomington is now a center for uh, Native students with Native scholarships. Uh, Northwestern um, 
you know, it's sitting, it's downtown campus and it's uh, Evanston campus are both on the unceded lands of uh, Potawatomi. What are they doing about that? That's the question I would ask, right? And uh, so, um, you know, so it's, uh, will this be time consuming? Sure. Will it be energy consuming? Sure. Will it be resource consuming? Sure. <coughs> but it's the right thing to do. Great. So that concludes our event. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for your fascinating presentation and for your thoughtful answers to everyone's questions. Um, thank you to everyone for attending and hope to see you at an event in the future. Thank you, everybody. Happy Native American Heritage Month.